Hi, I'm Steve Williams and I'd like to welcome you to An Interview With, which is a series of video recordings we're going to be doing with well-known and not so well-known barbel anglers for Barbel Fishing World. Okay, this evening we're on the River Severn and I'm absolutely delighted to say I've got a good friend of mine, Lawrence Brakespear, to do our first interview. Lawrence, thank you very much for coming along. Hi Steve. How are you? I'm alright, you? Yeah, you're fishing as well? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's not the, 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 the ideal conditions. I mean, it, 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 I think there's a bit of a myth that, uh, you know, the, the higher that it is, the, you know, it's great for barber. Well, I'm not so sure. I, I like to be sure of a good bait presentation, and quite frankly, in these conditions, you, you, you're very limited on what you can do. But there are barbel feeding. Um, you've witnessed a couple of liners. And I've had a couple of uh, modest fish, you know. What, I well, eight, eight pound, that's well, not, well, not no, modest no, for the seven. I, I didn't weigh, but I, I guessed it. Yeah. And uh, But, it, you know, I'm quite happy, on, you know, with the conditions. And there's fish there, so uh, we may get some more. Brilliant. And we've got about four foot on, we think, at the moment. I reckon about yeah, four and, foot. and dropping. Uh, and, I'm, you know, the swim that I'm fishing here um, is, a, is a, 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 I'd say it's a known swim. Uh, it gets fished a lot. But there's very few people really know how to fish it. You've really got to know this swim. It's, it's got a lot of character. And within the swim, there are actually three swims. You've got a long bank here. Uh, and when the, when the river is at its summer level, uh, you can fish, you know, on the edge of the bush here, which you, you, you've got a lot of scope. You can fish the undercut bank here. There's a lovely deep undercut here. And probably now we may have 12 feet of water in front of us. So it's a very interesting swim, lots of snags, uh, and historically an outstanding barbel yeah. swim. So, um, okay, so take us back, Lawrence, right to the start. Um, you know, I think the guys will be interested in, you know, how did it start for you? Where did fishing start for you? Where were you brought, born, brought up? You know, your early experiences. Yeah, well, I'm a Brummie, um, as I think that's fairly well known. Um, I was born in 1953. Um, and I started fishing um, probably when I was about eight years old. My mother uh, had, had got two or three brothers that were interested in fishing and, uh, and I think really rather than just tag along with them at eight years old, my mother bought me a very cheap plastic looking rod. Woolworths? Uh, I don't know about Woolworths, <laughs> I don't know where it was from, but it, it was enough to get me going yeah. and the, the first time I ever went fishing uh, was at Cannon Hill Park and catching small roach and perch and and really it's I'd have to f you know it's like a fast forward situation it seemed to take off from there you know the next thing you know I was a fisherman and uh, I was fishing with mates and so on and so forth and it wasn't long I mean starting a tape by the time I was 13 14 I was wandering around Cannon Hill Park again in a camouflage jacket in a big landing net and a loaf of bread after the car. So the, the, the baptism of, of uh, the, the fishing experiences that I had were quite varied, but the main thing was I was very fortunate to be, uh, uh, I, I, the only thing I can say is in, inspired by some extremely good anglers. Um, I was a probably a, a nuisance to them following them round. Uh, these are the guys from the Birmingham Specimen Group and I used to watch them and I really learned from them um, and I, I, I'm glad to say I didn't just try to copy them you know, you know it was true inspiration and I watched everything they did I remember a guy Terry Dinsmore um, who was a member of the Birmingham Specimen Group showed me how to you know whip a, a, a hook to, the, to a shank uh, to get better presentation rather than just a standard knot. It was things like that that really made me the angler that I am today. Yeah. All about presentation. You think that's the key to, to fishing full stop is presentation? I, I think it is. I think because what we're trying to emulate is an, a, a natural source of food. And natural food doesn't have leads attached to it, doesn't have hooks attached to it, or line. Um, and even the freebies that we offer, I mean, I'm fishing with pellets now, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting small PVA bags of small pellets, uh, 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 and I'm fishing a pellet, but the pellets in the bag have got nothing attached to them. No. That's a natural pellet. Yeah. And yet the, the bait that I'm using 
uh, has got a lead attached to it, a trace attached to it, a hook attached to it. So it's most unnatural, even in that micro environment. Um, so I, I, I do believe that presentation um, is the key to all things. And it doesn't mean to say that everything has to be delicate and, and you know, gossamer tackle and small hooks. You can, you, you, you can fish with quite substantial tackle, what can appear to be a little bit brutal, heavy, but it can be the, the actual presentation that that, demand, that swim demands on that day and at that moment in the species. It's like now, uh, I'm fishing here, and uh, you know, you'd know, you look at my gear and think, oh dear, that's a bit heavy, but it suits the conditions. Okay, well, while we're talking about the gear, then run us through what you've got. I mean, yeah, there'll be guys on the on, on BFW that, that do a lot of barbel fishing, mm. you know, so I think most people's standard tackle would be 10, 12 pound mainline. Mm. Um, is that the sort of thing you've got on there now? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, as I said to you earlier, I, 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 I do like using a centipede, and I don't like using a centipede purely because I'll, I'll say that it's the best, because it, it isn't, it doesn't answer every situation. And I started with a, a centipede on the basis that I like to play fish on it, but I quickly realised that I'd be undergunned, yeah. um, and I, I, I put a bait runner on, still offering the same as a, a centipede, uh, as far as a free spool mechanism, so when a fish does take the bait, it can run with it. Um, I'm using a pound and, a pound and three quarter test curve rod, uh, which is a Drennan um, specialist barbel, which I really rate as a, a barbel rod. They're a little bit more expensive uh, than your average rod, uh, but I think that, that for, for what I want, they're brilliant. Um, I don't spend a lot of money uh, on line. Um, I, I buy bulk spools of Daiwa Sensor, which I think is a great line and you can get miles of the stuff, you know, for less than a tenner. Yeah. That does me. It's never, ever let me down. In fact, I've been let down more by um, more expensive lines. Uh, but I think the rod, the reel, and the line get the best that you can. But again, about it's about the presentation. You know, I use a, a, a strip teased uh, type uh, hook link that I think really does give me the edge because it allows the bait to have a level of waft waftability whilst a, you know, a proportion of the trace can be left coated which makes it heavy and sink to the bottom the last three to four or even five inches of that trace can be stripped which gives you a lovely action in the water and a, 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 nice, uh, a nice presentation that the fish can approach it the fish can actually waft it by its pectorals, nose it, and it will, it, I think it will behave as natural as a pellet can. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay, so I mean, I don't want to embarrass you, but growing up and, and starting barbel fishing, you were one of the names that were, became one of my heroes, and they always say it's never great to meet your heroes, but um, I'm lucky enough to, to sort of meet you a few years ago, and we've become pretty good mates. Yeah. Um, but t take us back to, right back to, I mean, I, th I guess one of the historic times on the seven was Howard Maddox's and his his record barbel, and I think you were there that day, weren't you? Yeah, and and I think it it, it it's fair to say that that whilst yes, uh, Howard's fish was a momentous occasion, you've got to remember that we'd been fishing the seven uh, since the early seventies, yeah. and we've spoke about you know that my days, uh, you know early days of barbel fishing. Um, getting involved in the, the Seven Barb Research Programme with Dr Peter Hunt of Liverpool University. You know, we were catching a lot of barbel, you know, 1971-72, and really taking it to a different level. Was that was that down on the Lower Seven then? Were you down on no, the Lower Seven no, then? No, no, no. Th this was very much focused around, not far from here actually, I mean, we're at Hampton Load at the moment. Uh, the majority of the work that we did was around the Hiley area okay. near the ship. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, we used to camp uh, up in the field there and the whole weekends would be used. I mean, Peter Hunt would set up, um, uh, you know, a mobile laboratory and do autopsies. Uh, uh, you know, he'd kill barbel yeah. um, because he was, he was <coughs> interested in the infestation of barbel by, the, by uh, parasites, parasites, various yeah. parasites. Um, and he did, uh, you know, he looked at the scales for, uh, you know, to, to uh, do an, an analysis on their growth. 
and the, the you know the best years and so on and so forth. So this was real cutting edge stuff. This oh, was real cutting edge. Yeah, they, this this won a bunch of blokes that were barbel fishermen that just thought they were being a little bit clever. This was a proper government run, uh, headed up by a, a qualified fish biologist, Dr. Peter Hunt. And the, you know, a paper was written. Uh, as there, there have new, there has been numerous papers, numerous papers being written uh, on barbel, both in this country and in Europe. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating species. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and really, it was from there that that we developed. I developed. I don't know about being somebody's hero, but I developed uh, as a barbel angler. Um, and obviously then we uh, running parallel to that we've got the river team that was starting to produce fish but it wasn't until um, really probably the the late 80s that we started to realize that some big fish were coming off the lower seven yeah. uh, Des Taylor and Phil Godsell had started to fish it and feedback was coming that they were getting the odd bigger fish uh, going back to the, the barbel research, it started to click then that when we were doing the barbel research program, that smaller fish that we tagged tended to head up, off upstream, where larger fish that we tagged always seemed to end up in downstream positions of where we tagged them. You, you, you say tagged? Were you actually electronic tags that you were no, following? No, no, or no, no. This, this, was, this, this is long boot. So long. you were you were relying on repeat captures, effectively. Yes, right? yeah. yeah. I mean, it was a proper tagging program yeah. uh, where fish were weighed, measured, uh, and a tag was put into their uh, gill cover, and it was an aluminium uh, tag uh, that was forced in. It was numbered, and that fish was recorded. And we depended not on our own repeat captures, which I have to say were few and far between but anglers in general on the River Seven at that time. We put various notices in the Angling Times and the Angler's Mail at that time saying, look, if you get one of these things. What, what we also did, we issued to various clubs little envelopes uh, where we asked for scales to be taken from the shoulder of the fish and put into those envelopes with the tag number on it, the date it was caught and where it was caught. So there was quite a significant amount yeah. of analysis done and uh, the information that we got, I'm sure, helped Peter Hunt with his research programme. But ourselves of anglers, we started to, be, we were taken to another level yeah. in understanding the species, yeah. both winter fishing, nighttime fishing, daytime fishing, how singular fish behave, how the large shoals behaved, and so on. Fantastic stuff. It was invaluable. Yeah. Okay, so take us back to the, the Howard Maddox fish and, and, and the day that was caught. Well, that was a day, um, and it was uh, it was a uh, it was a day that I I nearly didn't go fishing. Um, the river was up; it was probably ten foot up, raging through. Um, and I got a call. I, I was in the barbel catchers club at the time, and I developed a, an acquaintance friendship with a, a very good barbel angler. Uh, called Dave Evans and uh, I had a phone call basically saying um, would you like to see a 16 pound barbel and well you can guess the answer to that where what yeah. how you know are you you know you're pulling me leg and uh, he told me the story of, of what had happened and I immediately phoned Steve Pope because Steve Pope I knew was staying in the area on the lower seven and we met Dave in a lay boy and uh, he was he got his mate with him um, a, a lad called Brian and uh, we followed him off followed him to you know where this this spot was and I, I don't think I could ever find the area where the fish was caught if you ask me yeah because we were that mesmerized in following Dave but when we got there, we were, we were, you know, I mean, this place was not far from Upton on Severn. Uh, we were confronted with a river that was probably 150 yards wide, with three or four blokes fishing a big, huge eddy. And uh, one of them was Howard Maddox. And as soon as he pulled the sack in, he got it in a scoop sack. And uh, as soon as this fish was shown to us, I knew 
that I was witnessing something very, very special. I mean, since that time, there have been numerous 15 pounders being caught, repeat captures yeah, yeah. of 15s. I had a 15 pounder myself. Um, but to, you know, to me, that capture has never been eclipsed. To eclipse it, we'd have needed to catch a 17 or an 18 pounder. Yeah. But when I think of all the years I'd been fishing for barbel and knew there was a record barbel in the seven, and there probably is now, waiting to be caught, to see that was one of the most, you know, the high spot of my life so, at that time. So you, you say you, you couldn't find us, take us to the spot again now, but no. I mean, the famous picture of Howard is, is that big green umbrella sitting in the background. Yes. And I'd love to know what was behind that umbrella. The, what was behind that umbrella was the river. Uh, and uh, it wasn't uh, actually done. I don't believe that picture was taken uh, with a view of keeping the place a secret. Was that uh, not in, in, in the thoughts of people that day? No, no, no. I don't even know when that picture was taken. Because um, that appeared in the BAA handbook guide. That's it, yeah. That's the one. That, I mean, I think if anybody talks about Howard's fish, yes, yeah. the, the conversation crops up about. And I mean, we all, we all assumed it was a house or a, a tree that was no, obvious. No, no, you know? it wasn't. Because in, in, in today's barbell angler, I think the, the first thing they'd want to do is hide yes. where they caught their fish from. No, they, they, there was no need. Um, it was in a, a fairly remote part of the Lower Seven. Um, I've got an idea of the area, yeah. but I, I'd never fished it before. I knew it. It was a day ticket farm stretch. It wasn't a BAA water. No. It was a you know it was a day ticket stretch that Howard and his mates had fished, and the swim they fished they purely they were purely there uh, because it was one place on the seven that day you could put a bait out. It was fishable. It, it was fishable because yeah. it was just horrendous. The conditions were absolutely horrendous. And you did fish in some. I mean, I mean, we've spoke about this privately, but I mean, y you know, you were out in some absolutely horrific, and out every single day. You know, I mean, at the detriment. I think you've admitted it to me at the detriment of almost family life at oh, times. That, absolutely. That your fishing was took over. You know, everything. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I was. I've always had a theory, um, and I still stick to it today. That there is a level. It's almost like a glass ceiling that every angler can reach you don't get better you, you can only reach a certain level in angling and we can all learn to cast out to bait up to use the rig of the moment the bait of the moment what becomes paramount to be a successful big fish fisherman especially barbel is time if you get a guy that goes once a month you won't catch many barbel uh, you get a guy that goes seven days a week, he'll catch a lot of barbel, yeah. especially if he's at that level. And the, there are a lot of barbel anglers that are at that level. Uh, so it's about time. And those years from about 1993 to probably 1998, I was fishing probably seven nights a week. Uh, and, and that isn't just during the, the summer months, that was winter months, uh, right the way through. Even Boxing Day, we were, you know, where, where most people were fishing for pike, uh, myself and my mate Adrian Dolman, we would fish for barbel. But, you know, the results were there. Um, you know, I've had, I've lost count now. I mean, I, I remember counting up, you know, 92 double figure barbel, 95. Double. I can remember texting Fred Crouch and Steve Pope from a famous swim on Boocham Court one night um, saying, I've just had my 100th double figure barbel. And uh, uh, both Fred and Steve phoned me immediately and congratulated me. I've had in excess of 200 double figure barbel now. Um, but it was the backup fish. And what it was, I was fishing for that monster. Um, I, I will, I, I'll never say that I became blasé and didn't like catching uh, big barbel, nine pound plus fish. I was completely obsessed by the species and I transferred that onto the team. Uh, not only did we have a lot of big fish out of the, the lower seven, but we also started to fish the team very very seriously and adopted those big fish uh, rather than turning up and just fishing for barbel as i've always said we had a mindset in our minds eye we were fishing for one fish 
at any one time. We were fishing for the biggest, bigger fish, and we'd look at a spot and we'd think, where would that fish be? We developed presentation, different rigs, anti snag rigs, the large baits. We knew that large bait. When we discovered brocamine, we were getting a, a double, a trip. I lost count of the 10s and 11 pounds. Repeat fish, though, were they? But, or, or? Uh, well, in, in saying <clears> that, I, I, I always said not. There was only there was one uh, fish that we caught quite, quite a few times at Brockham in, um between us. So it was very recognisable. But I'd say no, because uh, yeah, th there was probably four or five very big groups. I won't call them shoals. They were groups of extremely large fish. Uh, and when I'm talking about large fish, 12 pound plus, um, we lost a lot of fish because irresponsibly, I don't know, we, we were using bloody good gear, strong gear, but we were, we were putting baits where nobody else would put yeah. baits and it was a really hook and hole yeah. situation. Yeah. Uh, we lost quite a few fish, but we had a lot of big fish. I mean, my, my biggest was 13, nine. Uh, that was taken from Brockhamin. I'll never forget the day that the biggest fish I ever saw was when I, uh, a, a piece of a large piece of meat, and I'm talking twice the size of an England's Glory box of matches. I was swinging it out to uh, to cast under a tree, and this bait came off because it was it was quite hot, and it sank to the bottom. And I watched it go down. Uh, which was quickly followed by the hordes of minnows, minnows that were there. Yeah, yeah. And then I, as I, I watched this, the minnows dispersed in a second, and the biggest barbel I've ever seen just came up, sucked it in, and went back to where it had come from. Mm. I never saw that fish again. Mm. But I think that fish was... If somebody said that was as big as Howard's fish, I'd believe them. Yeah. In essence, it may have been a 15 pounder but it was the biggest it, fish that it, I'd it, seen it, on the team oh yes yeah there was a group of fish that they all seemed to be around that 13 14 pound mark um, so it was a great time and we fished the Warwickshire Avon um, but the, you know the, the the lower seven and the lower team to mid team were our stomping grounds and it was about putting time in but yeah, there was a cost of that, yeah. um, and, and, and I wouldn't advise people to do it now. With the benefit, benefit of hindsight, I don't know, was I right to do it? I can't do anything about you it can't, now. No, you can't I change. can't change it. No, no, not you know, it, I, I sometimes, sit when I'm sit fishing on my own, I, I think back to those days. We had some great times, we had some laughs, you know. You know, Des Taylor, I mean, you, you've only got to fish with him, and I can... I, the stories I can tell you, you know, yeah, him. I bet you can. You know, he, 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 in those days, yeah. we, we had some great times. Yeah, yeah. fantastic stuff. And, um, and 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 now, I mean, where do you see the barbel sea now? I mean, it's 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 a whole different kettle of fish these days. I, I now, couldn't. I, guess. I could never have predicted uh, the barbel scene as it's called and as it is now. Um, I mean, you know, I saw the and uh, was a founder member of the Barbel Society. We wanted to take barbel fishing to a, a greater audience. We didn't want it to be steeped in mysticism and specialism. Mm -hmm. You know, um, we wanted to open it up. It was a great thing to, to have. But in saying that, I have to say that there are some aspects that I, I don't like. I, I don't like commercialism, commercialism in anything, quite frankly, because the moment commercialism uh, gets into something, that start it starts to decline from that moment on. Um, uh, fishing as a whole, I think that there's, there's a level of decline. We've seen the the change in carp fishing. We've seen the change in still water fishing. You know the muddy puddles. We've gone through the still yeah. water barbel thing. Barbel today, um, barbel fishing. I think there's a lot of people fish particular methods that I'd like them to try other methods. Yeah. You know, I'm, okay, I'm fishing today. I've got a bait runner on. Uh, there's no point in touch ledgering uh, because, as I say, it's, it's all about a particular type of presentation. But I know there's barbel anglers out there that have never held a rod, never felt for bites, no. and never strike. No. A striking barbel angler now is rare. Yeah. 
because all we do is, you know, oh, and I say, I'm doing it myself. Self-hooking rigs. Yeah, but you're fishing to the conditions. To, 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 yeah, I, mean, right. I, mean, I, I mean, I've seen you touch legend. Yeah. I've seen you, you know, fishing with huge pieces of meat. In fact, one of the famous pictures that I remember to talk back about, so you've been one of my heroes, was you on the lower seven. I think it was at Angling Times, and there's a photo of the guys up on the bank looking down on yeah, you, yeah. and you're swinging out half a tin of luxury. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, it, 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 let's, get it, let, let's get it on the record now. <laughs> I, I've, I'm almost at the point now where Lawrence Breakspear didn't even take the meat out the tin. Yeah. Um, half a tin of meat is a huge piece of meat. In essence, we probably used our big pieces of meat were about a third of a tin, yeah. to be honest with you. <clears throat> it would take one heck of a barbel to take half a tin of meat. Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, we, we, were pro we were using a third of a tin and ragging that meat up. Yeah. We, we, we were great believers in trying to make the meat look as natural as possible in a, in a, na in a nature type way of ragging it up and roughing it up. Loosing the edges, uh, uh, loose, that, that, that sort yeah. of thing. All, all yeah. That, but yeah. we were, yes, we were using large pieces of meat. And it, the, the one thing with the large pieces of meat, it did allow you to target you know, the bigger barbel. Bigger than average fish. Uh, that's right, and it yeah. still works today. We yeah. know it does. Yeah. You, you, you use that, that type of method. But I don't know, where, where's barbel fishing now? There's a, there's a lot of aspects to it, Steve, that I, I don't like. But it, barbel fishing will always be there. It's people. Yeah. Uh, that, that what we're talking about yeah, yeah, now, really, yeah. what you're saying yeah. is, what do you think of barbel anglers, anglers today? Yeah. yeah. Uh, because the poor old barbels, he's still there. He still lives the same as he did a thousand years yeah. ago. It's the barbel anglers that uh, I, I can I, I can differ with. Um, each to their own, though. At the end of the day, but I disagree with a lot of the things they do. Look mm. at the bait industry, the the way that's take. I, I'm just waiting for it to. The bubble to burst, if yeah. anything. I, yeah. I can't see it having any sustainability. Mm -hmm.